My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Melinda Vale Goodnight. Today's leadership quote comes from my mom. Stop waiting for someone to ask you to do it and just do it. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Thank you for listening to the Leader Assistant Podcast. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in. Please check out the event schedule at leaderassistantlive.com and we would love to see you at one of our upcoming events. All right, enjoy this episode. Hello, Leader Assistants. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows, and today I'm very excited to speak with Melinda Vale. Good night. Uh, she is an executive assistant at Southwest Airlines. Melinda, how's it going? It's great this morning. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Yeah, and you're in Dallas, is that right? I am in Dallas. Awesome. So normally I start off with a question about your very first job, but I'm going to actually do a, a different question and then jump back to that one. Okay. Um, if you had a day where you could go go and do anything in the world with unlimited resources, what would you do and where would you go? And I'm going to say... Um, because I love Southwest and, um, who could forget this commercial? I'm going to say you're, if you were free to move about the country, where would you go? <laughs> Got it. I would go to, I would love to hike the Swiss Alps. Hmm. Southwest is not flying there yet, but who knows what the future holds. Hmm. So that's your pitch to them, right? That's my let's, pitch. Let's get there. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, what was your very first job and what skills did you learn that you still use today? My very first job was working in uh, my aunt and uncle's grocery store. I grew up in small town, nowhere, Texas, very small. uh, And the grocery store was very small. But I learned to, and I'm doing air quotes here, cut meat. They had big sides of beef brought in. So I had to learn how to make hamburger, uh, cut steaks, cut ribs, all of that that entails selling meat. And what that taught me was I now don't eat red meat (laughs) and accountability. My aunt was wonderful to me in teaching me that if I said I was going to do it, do it. Show up, be there, be accountable. If you do something that um, is wrong, or you shouldn't have done, just raise your hand and say, hey, I did this. So accountability, um, she taught me that very young. Hmm. That's great. So we talked before about your interesting career, um, kind of accidentally following into the EA career. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your progression and when and why you became an EA? You know, I came to the party kind of late, but I got here as soon as possible, as they say. Um, I built and sold homes here in the Metroplex, in the DFW Metroplex, for years and loved it, had a great time. Um, But then 2007 happened. You couldn't give a home away, and I needed to pay the bills, had to figure out what the next step in my life looked like. So I had to reinvent myself. Luckily, I had a friend who was in managing a staffing agency. She called and said, hey, there's a hospital close to you that needs an EA for six weeks. And I said, I don't know what an EA is. An executive assistant, they only need someone for six weeks. Now, I knew I had had an assistant, but I didn't really know what an assistant really did every day. And I said, you know, I'm not interested. And she was like, okay, well, if you change your mind, it's $26 an hour. And I was like, wait, what? (laughs) Part-time, $26 an hour? Okay, I can do that. And long story short, that was the beginning of my career. It was in a hospital that uh, my first leader afforded me the opportunity to learn, to grow. Um, It was an amazing opportunity to learn the ins and outs of medical staff in quality 
and I supported a CNO, a chief nursing officer also. So that was the beginning of my career. Hmm. So what was it that kind of drew you in and kept you in the EA role? What, what, what did you love about that role? I think every day you learn something new. There is always something else. You're, you're doing this today, but tomorrow you may be doing something else. Um, I started learning and reading policies. If you can imagine policies in a hospital, um, they're, it, it's staggering the amount of policies that are, regu- that are regulated within a hospital setting. So it's in the same way with Southwest and not necessarily policies, but it's something new every day. It is never the same old, same old, never boring. Hmm. You, you actually, actually, I, I, I would really appreciate a boring day every now and then. <laughs> Yeah, my uh, my go to phrase on describing my job is "There's never a dull moment." Definitely, definitely, that is so true. So, how did you end up at Southwest? Uh, great question. I have learned that there is a t- statistic that says it's easier to get into Harvard, be accepted in Harvard, than getting a getting a job at Southwest. Mm. Um, I had met someone that was serving on a board at the hospital where I was working and she stopped me one day and after a meeting and said, are you happy with your job? Which I was miserably unhappy. I had changed leaders and that's a whole different program for you and I. But, um, I said, of course, I love it here. And she's, you would be great at Southwest. Oh, you're so kind. I appreciate that. But she planted a seed. And six weeks later, I think I emailed her and said, hey, if there was ever any opportunity, I might be interested. Another month goes by. She sends me an email with a job code and says, if you're serious, you need to apply right now. I applied, interviewed, got the job. Hmm. And is that the same role you have today? It is. Wow. Different leader, same role. Nice, nice. So over your time as an assistant, what's one of the biggest mistakes you made and what did you learn from making that mistake? Oh, I just love talking about this. <laughs> um, when I was at the hospital, um, a board member came in, set in on a meeting one morning. And after the meeting, it's a room full of nurses Everyone, after the meeting, everyone is needing something from me uh, because I support the CNO, the chief nursing officer. And the board member actually asked me at that time if she could get time with my leader. And I was like, of course you can. What day are you thinking? And she told me and I said, yep, she has availability. I never put it on the calendar. Mm. I, I was surrounded by chaos Uh, talking to other people, didn't focus, didn't write it down. The day that she walked in two weeks later, I knew exactly why she was there. (laughs) So uh, if it had been anyone other than a board member, but she was gracious, she was kind, she, uh, she, it it was, it couldn't have been any better for me. Um, I went out of my way to make it happen that very day and we worked it out. But that feeling of, oh, my gosh, that your heart just sinks and knowing that you've really just screwed up. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Not a fun feeling. Not a fun feeling at all. So do you have any tips on managing an executive's email inbox? You know, I think it's so different. Um per leader. Uh, Some leaders just want you to manage the heck out of it, get rid of all the trash, tell me what's in there. Um, Others, and the reason I know this is I changed leaders this year in February. And my leader now is very on it. She is in her inbox all the time. Um, And I think it's also she's never had an assistant. And it's that trust of, oh, my gosh, what she's what is she going to do in my email? So we're still building that trust. But tips. um, 
I, I think getting rid of all the spam, all the trash for them, that's huge. Everyone, I think, does that. But also trying to stay on top of it. How often do you look at it? How often do you have time to look at it? I actually schedule a morning and afternoon. So I go look at it at 10 o'clock and I go look at it at 3 o'clock. So that's how I manage it right now. That's great. I love the uh, scheduled time blocks for that. That's I'll forget. Brilliant. Yeah. So you mentioned um, you've called your executives leaders. Is that a Southwest culture thing? Absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. So, so how would you, um, you know, this, this podcast is called The Leader Assistant. How would you kind of talk about the assistants? Do they, do they talk about assistants as leaders? Do you, um, does, it, does that make sense? Yes, it does. And aren't we fighting that battle everywhere? Hmm. I think assistants, and I'm going to talk about what I know in this very moment. Um, we're putting our hand up. We're saying, hey, we want to play. We can do this job. We want to lead. We are leaders. We want a seat at the table. We want a voice at that table. Um, and I, I think it's not just Southwest Airlines. I think it's any large company. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, be at some admin awards to uh, attend several on the West Coast and San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Uber, LinkedIn, Google, uh, Maxim, we're all fighting that battle. We're all fighting for that position of, hey, I need you. I, I can do this. I have something to offer. Um, so I don't think it's just Southwest Airlines. I think we are all there. Um, I think Google has, and I may be wrong about this, um, have stopped using the words executive assistant mm -hmm. and use business partners Yeah, I think you're right. in their competency models. So um, I, I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think makes an assistant a leader? Standing up. You've got to stand up. You've got to say, I, I, I think there's a great quote that says everything you want is just on the other side of fear. I think that assistants um, have to overcome that fear of voicing what they know is right or their opinion. Um, I, I think that for me in this very moment at Southwest, it's um, standing up, showing up. Uh, and here's the other thing. You can get a seat at the table, but if you don't handle it properly, you're not going to be invited back. Hmm. So how do you continue that? I think it's building that relationship with your leader, having them learn to trust you, have, have them seek you out for, for counsel or advice. Um, and it's hard. It's, it's a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So one of those things that um, I've I've seen and heard a lot about is as far as standing up and and speaking up from the assistant role is something like professional development and standing up for yourself and you know showing the ROI on professional development dollars from your company if they don't already provide that. Um, how have you advocated to get training dollars for your professional development, whether it's certifications or conferences? Um, and, you know, how's that gone in your career? I think we have not because we ask not. When you make the case, my leaders, and I'm, I'm going to speak for, for me, my leaders have always been very open to that. But I had to ask. They weren't going to come to me and say, oh, would you like to spend $1,500 and go to this conference? Right. Um, but my training dollars are built into my department's training dollars. So I, I advocated for myself and said, hey, these are three conferences that I would like to attend 
I love spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. So these are the three conferences I'd like to attend. These are the cost. And this is what this is the ROI on each of these conferences. This is what I would gain. And this is how I think it would help us, Mm -hmm. my leader and myself. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think it's a great argument. I, I, and I don't really think it's an argument. I think it's an ask. Yeah. Awesome. So what about certific certifications? Um, there's a variety of them, uh, for assistance. We've got PACE and CAP, et cetera. Do you feel these certifications are worth the time and money and why or why not? Talk to me in April. <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually studying for CAP right now. Okay. And I'm going to take the exam. I think it's early April. I don't know. I wish I knew. I'm just in the very beginning of this. But there, there is so much out there. Um, and how, how, you know, how do you quantify it? How do you qualify it? Um, what's good, what's bad. Um, I don't know. And I I know Southwest is looking at um, across the board of bringing something in, maybe, um, you know, how, 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 what does that look like? I don't know. Talk to me in April. I'll have a better understanding of CAP then. I don't know about PACE, but Joan Burge, out of uh, Las Vegas has something also there and and it looks really good. Also, I, to answer your question, I don't know. Hmm. As you, as you study for the CAP, is that, are you finding that some of the information that you're, you know, studying for that test has been helpful? Um, some of it has, but some of it is very uh, mundane. It's mm-hmm. an executive assistant does it every day, all day. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so TBD. <laughs> TBD, yes. What about degrees? Uh, you know, an, an MBA, for example. Um, do you have thoughts on education? Uh, for, I do. Yes. I that's that's where I think it. That's where the rubber meets the road. I think it has to be a higher education. I think there needs to be some sort of degree. Debbie Gross uh, did some really great work out at UCSC in California putting together a program. I don't know about the other parts of the country, but here where I live in North Texas, there's nothing at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a business administration degree, there's an MBA, uh, but for the assistant uh, where you need uh, business writing, business documentation, interpersonal communications, public speaking, debate speaking, um, I, there's so much that at a higher level a degree would help. Yeah. Awesome. So what about, let's talk about the executives for a second and maybe talk to the executives um, and the leaders in your your case, uh, what's one tip you would give your leaders to help them get more out of their assistance or out of you? <laughs> I'm, I'm a big proponent, and I know you are too, of the weekly check-in. Hmm. Um, and my leader and I, if we don't have that face-to-face, which we do most uh, 99% of the time, I'm emailing her because she's on her email. I'm emailing her questions. I'm emailing her thoughts. Um, This is what next week is looking like. What do you think about this? Um, But the other thing is, uh, listen. And it's hard to tell an executive or a leader, I I just need you to listen to me for just a second. Because they're being bombarded. But 10 hours a day, they're being bombarded by their schedule, other leaders, other executives, meetings. I need 10 minutes. I need you to listen to me. So that sounds very simplistic. It's very hard sometimes. Yeah. How about uh, you mentioned, you know, when you were talking about your mistake of not writing that event down or putting it on the calendar with the board uh, member, what you mentioned there was a lot of interruptions. It was just kind of a crazy day. What's your best 
tip or trick for managing constant interruptions? I've learned to say no a lot. I, I support a department. Not only do I support a, a leader in my department, but I support uh, my department. So learning to say no, learning to, um, can I get back to you? Can you give me 10 minutes? Instead of trying to be the people pleaser and just take everything on, that was my biggest problem. And sometimes it still is my biggest problem is to think that I can support the world and I can't. Uh, to know my limits um, and to just say no, but I can get back to you in 30 minutes. That's great. So if you could snap your fingers and instantly give all assistants more of something, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, vulnerability. Being vulnerable. Being able to raise your hand and say, I don't know. Somewhere along the way, EAs, and I'll speak for myself, maybe everyone is not this way, I have be, I have put it upon myself that I need to be subject matter expert on everything. It's not the case. We're not. Um, being vulnerable, being able to ask the question, to say, I don't understand, to raise your hand, I need help. Can you help me with this? I think somewhere along the way, we've lost that ability or we see it as a weakness and help helping asking for help sometimes can be the smartest thing we can do. Hmm. Love it. hundred percent agree. So what is something that if you, if an assistant called you um, today or tomorrow and said, I'm not being respected in my role, what's something that you would share or, or encourage them with? Depending on, are they not being respected by their leader? Are they not being respected by a team member? Um, I think we all face that at some point in time. Um, and I'll speak for me. I'm a confronter. I had much rather have the conversation than to feel bad and waste energy on something that may or may not be the case. So the first piece of advice I would say, if it's a team member, Go to them, have the conversation. And I know it's hard. I know it's uncomfortable. It can be awkward, but so is feeling less than. If it's your leader, same thing. Go in, close the door, and just let them know how you're feeling. And uh, I sometimes I think we put it, I think we create some things in our mind that may not be there, or it may be. But I think having the courage to have the conversation uh, is definitely the very, is the, is a good start. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Melinda, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with us and uh, really appreciate your insight and wisdom. And um, is there somewhere we can find you online and support, uh, support you and connect and say hi to you? LinkedIn. Everybody come and join me on LinkedIn. That's the best place to be. My Twitter handle is Melville. Awesome. Well, I'll share those links in the show notes. And thanks so much again. And we'll talk soon. Thanks, Jeremy. I had a great time. Keep doing what you're doing. Please review on Apple Podcasts. Go Bullos.com.